right, welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience as we, with, our, with our updated timeline at the end of general session there. Um, so I am very happy that everyone is here to chat about virtual chapter activities. Is obviously going to be a very, uh, very relevant topic for this upcoming fall. Um, so we really encourage you guys to, to share questions, ideas, discussions. We had a lot of questions for this panel. So um, our moderator, Aaron Cunningham, will try to get through as many as possible. Um, anyway, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, District 7 Justice Benson Chapter, Aaron Cunningham. Aaron, it's all yours. Thank you, Emily. All right, well, welcome all to this incredibly high stakes uh, panel discussion on how to have an engaging Zoom conversation, because if we fail to engage you here, there's absolutely no prayer that you will succeed in having your own engaging Zoom conversation. So I'm excited about today. I'm excited about the topics we're going to address, and especially our panelists who are far more qualified to be here than I am. Um, some of you may have had the opportunity to see me um, do the presentation for um, how to have this engaging Zoom panel thing earlier, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, but now we're going to expand that topic even a little bit more and talk about some of the different uses and applications our other panelists have already done with Zoom communication. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce them um, just down the line here quickly. And then we're going to have each panelist kind of explain why they're on this panel, how they've leveraged Zoom technology and other remote uh, broadcasting to their advantage throughout this pandemic. So as Emily already said, uh, my name is Aaron Cunningham. I'm the District 7 Justice Benson Chapter. Um, I am on this panel because this is the best they could do on short notice. And um, I think they just really like to watch me struggle in Zoom communication. So uh, additionally with us today, we have um, Nicole Winget, the international board member at large who is running again and best wishes to you, Nicole, in that. Uh, she hails from the Willis chapter and the Triangle Area Alumni chapter. Additionally, we have with us uh, another Aaron, the greater Aaron, as I would refer to him, Aaron DeBrock. He is of the Truman chapter, as well as the Alaska statewide alumni chapter. Additionally, we have Aubrey Maples of the Watson Jr. chapter. And then last and certainly not least, and I'm gonna butcher the last name, Brett, I apologize in advance, Brett Hyink, University of Illinois, Springfield Pre-Law chapter. Uh, so having, gone through that entire rundown of everybody. Um, I'm going to selfishly take the stage here and kick things off with some general discussion about how to have a successful Zoom meeting. Um, and basically my role in this is to recap um, an hour's worth of presentation in about five minutes for you. So I'm going to be posting the link in the chat while our other panelists are talking in a moment um, so that you can watch that entire video if you would like. Um, if you can't suffer through the entire video, feel free to just get as much from the next five minutes as you can. Uh, but condensing it, and I'm attempting to share my screen, um, and I'm hoping that it's reflecting accurately. Um, can you all see, because I didn't follow my own rules here. Um, hang on, we'll try this again. The first step to hosting an engaging Zoom meeting is being prepared, which I'm failing to do here. So let's do it like that. Okay, can everyone see the slide that says what we'll cover today? Seeing nods of heads. Very good. All right, so these are the big topics that I covered in that presentation. Uh, the first thing you need to know about having a successful Zoom meeting is you got to tell people that you're having a Zoom meeting. Uh, this is a little more tricky than when we just see people going to and from work or in the law school. Uh, you have to be a little bit more prepared and plan things out a little bit further in advance to do a quality Zoom meeting. Uh, so the pre-meeting communication is essential. Uh, one of the questions, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but one of the questions I saw that's been posed is the best way to talk about uh, upcoming Zoom meetings. And the answer to that question is, as it is with all questions of law, it depends. 
Uh, so largely, you're going to be looking at who your audience is. Some audiences receive things well through text communication. Some do well through email. Some do well through uh, newfangled apps that I don't understand, like Whova, which to me just sounds like someone with a speech impediment talking about a vacuum cleaner. But um, Pre-meeting communication is important. It's important to know your audience and what's going to resonate most with them, what they're going to be checking. Uh, one thing that I would do when I served as a chapter officer is I would give kind of an entry poll questionnaire to all my officers. And one of the questions on it was, what is the best way to get a hold of you? And that's the type of communication channel you want to use to communicate uh, the pre-Zoom meeting. Now, Something to also be said is you have to update these people frequently. We're all busy. We've got a million things going on. And so we need to remember that we have to remind people. Uh, so you want to send out that email well in advance of the meeting, but then also send out another email a few days before and then another email the night before or the day of. So pre-communication is essential because if people don't know it's happening, they're definitely not going to show up. The next step to being successful is equipment assessment. This is where I failed 100% today. So normally, I actually have a little uh, iPad monitor up here that I log into the Zoom call on um, as just a participant so that I can see the exact view that all my participants are seeing. I was not prepared today. I didn't get that set up. Thus, I'm highly dependent on all of you to give me feedback and watch your video reactions to this presentation. Um, you also want to make sure you've got a microphone that works. You've got um, some sort of speaker system that works. And then most importantly of all, uh, you have to have reliable internet connectivity. There's nothing more frustrating than having someone who's lagging behind, their audio is cutting in and out. So it's important to make sure you have all the equipment you need to be successful. Presentation preparation is, of course, another important thing. Uh, making sure that you have your PowerPoint slides ready to go, making sure that you have an acceptable backdrop. Uh, if you're going to do the virtual backgrounds, that's great, but make sure that you um, are, are ready to go come presentation time. The pre-meeting follow-up, as I talked about earlier, you can't just tell somebody something once. In today's day and age, we have a million things going on, and so we have to remind people consistently so that they um, remember to show up. I don't have time to go into basic and intermediate Zoom mechanics, but I do have a series of tutorial videos that are posted on the website um, that are also found on my YouTube channel. I will uh, be sure to post links to those as well in the chat when I have our other panelists talking here in a moment. Uh, giving a polished presentation, this is simple. Practice makes perfect. You don't want to go in cold. Uh, before I hopped on for this panel discussion, I reread all of the questions that were in. I reviewed my PowerPoint slides for today. And so I made sure that I was as polished as someone like me can be for this presentation because there's nothing worse than watching someone just blankly read down a page on a screen. It's terrible live in person, but it's even worse when it's just a monitor talking at you. So you want to make sure uh, that you're polished. That way you can do our next point, which is engage the audience. Um, so there are a lot of ways in this conference that we've been engaging the audience. We've been doing raise hand functions. We've been doing stuff with the chat. Um, so those are good ways to engage the audience, but I'd encourage you all to consider a few other ways. So if you watch the um, the Zoom presentation that I previously did for one of our, um, you know, learning segments, our workshops, online webinars, that's the term I'm looking for. Um, you'll see that we played a game that I think is a lot of fun. It's a virtual background game where you change your background to different historic sites around the world, and then your audience competes to see who can answer the fastest for where that location is. It's a simple, easy game, and it engages your audience in a meaningful way. I don't think we have enough time to play it right now, um, but I would encourage you to do that. Another game that people have an absolute blast with is an object uh, finding game. So you, uh, you know, put on the screen, everybody run and go find, uh, you know, a bottle of glue. And so then everybody takes off, comes back, and they find a bottle of glue. Uh, we've done it with pets. We've done it with, um, you know, other people. We've done it with, 
different types of books, things like that. Um, it's a fun way to make sure your audience is engaged and actually requires them to physically get up, take a step away from the computer screen, recharge a little bit, uh, and stay engaged. So that's all important as well. And then finally, and I think this is usually the most overlooked part of presentations because uh, usually we get done with the presentation, we breathe a huge sigh of relief, and then we kind of forget about it. Uh, we need to do an after action review and assessment. Uh, that's the only way that we really improve. Um, although we can learn through our failures, it is really cemented if we sit down and look at uh, kind of a stop, start, continue analysis. So you stop and you say, what do I need to stop doing? What didn't go well in that presentation? Uh, what do I need to start doing that I didn't do? Um, and then what should I continue to do that did work and went well? And so very briefly, those are some of the components that you need to know to have a successful Zoom conference. And again, as I said, I will post some links uh, to the original video and then as well as to some of those Zoom tutorial videos. Of course, Zoom has their own tutorial videos, but they're not narrated by me. And so I think that you would be at a loss to not watch my tutorials because they're twice as long and probably not as helpful, but you get to listen to my voice even more. So recognizing the humor in that statement and that you don't want to listen to me talk for this entire time, I'm going to go ahead and move things down to our other panelists, probably more worthy. And uh, to kick things off, I'm going to go to someone that I know is always ready to take the baton and run with it. So I'm going to turn things over to Nicole Winget, our international board member at large. Uh, Nicole, please enlighten us as to how you have been leveraging Zoom and other remote technologies in the wake of this pandemic. Um, first off, Brother Cunningham, uh, Nicole Winget, Willis Chapter. Um, there's a saying at Navy boot camp, when they yell, are you ready? You have to scream back as loud as you can, always ready. So when you said always ready, it took every effort I had to not scream back always ready. <laughs> well played, well played. Um, thank you all for visiting the panel today. Um, part of the reason I'm here is my uh, main job at the university I work for is online education. So at the undergrad and law school level, I help educate our students in the online platform. I've been doing that for about five years now. Um, and then I'm also working on a project to um, create a process for fully virtual chapters. And we're looking at starting at the alumni level, specifically with a military focused chapter. And the reason we're starting with that is because the military tends to be a little bit more mobile than most alumni and we need a good way to keep them connected. It'll also give us a chance to work out a lot of the potential kinks that you can have with something completely virtual that could span many districts. Um, and so I'm working on how to leverage Zoom. Um, Brother Cunningham, as an educator, some of your tips just warmed my, my tiny little professor heart. Your engagement tips are amazing for professionals, for students, and everything. So bravo. I don't know if you know, but you're, you're sharing some of the best practices in, in online education, and I, I very much appreciate that. Um, so that's why I'm here, is that um, my, my job leads me to be tied into this and then working on the uh, virtual chapters um, are what, um, what my big file for Delta related project is right now. I'll turn the floor over to the next person. All right, very good. Well, moving down the line here, we're gonna go ahead and go to uh, the greater Aaron, Aaron DeBrock. And I know that you know a lot about this uh, because you manage an entire state of uh, Phi Alpha Delta, and so obviously have a lot of need for remote technology in the great Alaska wilderness. So uh, tell us a little bit more about why you're here, Brother DeBrock. Well, thank you, Brother Cunningham, and I want to acknowledge that your Aaron J will always be before my Aaron J. Um, anyway, Aaron Dobrook, uh, permanent member of Truman Chapter, uh, uh, and now justice of the newly formed Alaska statewide alumni chapter formed this year. Um, yeah, we cover a huge area and even just chartering our chapter had to be done virtually. We, we built a petition online um, and went through the, the PAD um, uh, directory to find all of the members that were in Alaska who might be interested in forming a chapter. And then from that, we had to figure out how to communicate. My, <laughs> my officers are all over the place. 
I'm in Anchorage, which is a, a near the middle of the state, uh, southern middle of the state. Um, John Whitecamp and Karen, brother Karen, are in Sitka, which is 600 miles southeast of me. My marshal is 600 miles northwest of me in, in the community formerly known as Barrow. And so what we've used, what we've done is just to organize meetings, we end up using Facebook a lot and phone calls a lot. But in order to actually have a chapter meeting or something like that, we end up, we end up using platforms like Zoom and Citrix um, to kind of host things. And there, there've been various, um, you know, different types of meetings take different amounts of time and, and pre-planning, but uh, we've had a lot of luck uh, everyone up up here acknowledges that we're pretty remote, um, and and so people are more willing to to deal with. Okay, well, I have to log into this thing. How does that work? But it becomes really, 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 really important, especially when you change platforms or you're using something a little different, to send out a little bit of explainer information, um, and then also to reach out to your board members the day before, just so that we all show up. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything further? Um, uh, not at the moment. All right, great. I'm sure you will get some great questions in the Q&A because I know I've got some questions about how you can manage all of that um, and keep everyone engaged. Um, all right, so this time we're going to turn to Aubrey Maples of the Watson Junior Chapter, and we're going to hear about some of the stuff that she has been implementing uh, with this technology. Hi, Aubrey Maples, Justice Watson Jr. Chapter. Our chapter has been virtual since March. Our, chapter, our school shut down right at the end of spring break, so we had to be nimble and adjust quickly to rapidly changing situations. So we've had our chapter meetings virtually. We have had a, um, we recently won the Outstanding Professionalism Program. For a, for a virtual event that we put together on the request from one of our members, um, our school didn't have graduation activities and wasn't, it wasn't going to be rescheduled. So a lot of our student population are non-traditional students, and this is a really, really big deal for them. For most of our students, they are the first person in their family to have graduated from higher education, and they are the first person in their family to pursue a professional degree. So this was a really big deal. And so we put together a online scrapbook and recognition program for them. We were able to have essentially our classes valedictorians and brother Judge Wade speak much like they would at a regular commencement activity. And we were able to honor and recognize the work that our, our students had done. Most importantly, what we've done is we've continued our virtual environment by having a lunch and learn series that began approximately three months ago. We have one event a month. Our first was a um, constitutional law discussion with professors from our law school who discussed the intersection of the First Amendment and the right to protest. That was attended by about 45 people. Our second event was addressing racism within the profession with uh, Janice Brown. She is a Brown Law Group in California. She spoke at our local Bar, Association, Bar Association's diversity event, and she was willing and, um, to share some of her time with us during that Lunch and Learn series. Our next one is coming up on the 21st of August, where Sister Stephanie Heron from our chapter is giving a presentation on internal biases and microaggressions. And the theme of all of these Lunch and Learn series is the focus on equity, diversity, and justice. Thank you. Excellent. What a great way to take on some of those challenging topics in a way that is very accessible for all kinds of members. And so, um, excellent work with that. Uh, now we come to our uh, final panelists here, and probably the most impressive to me in terms of initiative with all of this uh, is Brett Hyink of the University of Illinois Springfield Pre-Law Chapter. Uh, and to my knowledge, Brett, you are one of the very few, if not the only, pre-law people uh, to be asked to be on a panel for this convention. So uh, congratulations to you. We're excited to hear what you have been doing out at the University of Illinois Springfield. 
Thank you, Aaron. And thank you everybody for participating in this virtual panel. Um, hi everyone, my name is Brett Heink. I am the president of the University of Illinois Springfield Pre-Law Chapter. And I'm going to talk to you all today about my virtual event that I co-hosted with the University of Illinois at Chicago Pre-Law Chapter. The event was called the Midwest Vial for Delta Pre-Law Event. And we had over 28 speakers talk about their various concentrations of law to a group of pre-law students, law school, and alumni. And it was uh, planned for over two months. We worked really hard. Uh, the president of the University of Illinois at Chicago, Shreyas Shastri, uh, became my partner back in May with this event. We both worked very hard on this. And on my end, I worked with mostly going up to speakers, asking them if they would participate in this event. And on his end, he worked a lot with technology. Now, what was an awesome opportunity with this event was that uh, on Treas's end and on my end, Treas, for one, gained a lot of contacts and connections for his chapter. And on my end, I learned a lot about different virtual apps and programs that we can use during this global pandemic. Now, going forward, uh, this event had a postponement. It was originally planned to be to take place July 11th through the 12th, but due to technical difficulties, um, we thought we had everything set in stone, ready to go for this event, and we tried the Zoom platform. We had it originally uh, put on one person's account. Well, we misread this information, and it was actually um, supposed to be the owner that could create it and share it with other people that are also licensed users, something I'll get into later with some questions. But uh, we had a postponement in this event. It was a hard decision to make, but it actually benefited us in the long run because while we, uh, um, Speaker Renee Kamiko Hosman spoke uh, on July 11th through the 12th, um, because she was busy the following weekend. So we ended up losing her for the following weekend, but we actually gained two other speakers. Uh, Speaker Nicole Greida, who is an in-house uh, in counsel attorney, and also Shane Young, who is an uh, uh, immigration attorney. And so that benefited us, having more speakers, uh, more subjects that were covered. Uh, but then at the same time, too, we went from having a total of 94 people that registered for the event to having only about 20 participate the following weekend because many of them shifted their schedules to have work that weekend. So there were upsides and downsides to having the event postponed, but it ended up becoming a success in the long run because we have recorded videos that we hope in the future to create a library that many pre-law and law school students can view and learn about what opportunities exist and what avenues they can take in the practice of law. And with that being said, I would just like to end with uh, thanking the following speakers who are participating in this biennial convention in, uh, that is Renee Kamiko Hosman, Nicole Greida, Glenn Milgram, Cassidy Tolls, BJ Maley, John Norris, Jay Ross, John McKell, Jay, uh, Shane Young, Curtis Anderson, Ed Anderson, Ron Coleman, and Omari Jackson. And thank you all uh, for having me for this panel as well. And with that being said, I am out. Excellent, thank you. And um, you highlighted a couple of really important things there, Brett. Uh, one being uh, one of the great benefits of doing this, although I think we'd all prefer to be in person, but one of the benefits is being able to archive these discussions, uh, these learning events, uh, and kind of have that as a resource going forward. It also helps to keep a clear record of what exactly happened in each event. Additionally, um, you brought up a really good engagement thing, and that is shout outs. Um, so giving a shout out to people in the audience in Zoom conferences and virtual learning is a way to make sure that they're not falling asleep at the wheel. Speaking of which, uh, brother Peter, Peter uh, you are terrifying me. I saw a video of you driving while Zooming. Um, so be safe when you do these conferences as well. Make sure that your participants aren't trying to do too much at once. Uh, having had you all introduce yourself and a little bit about your expertise, I think we're ready to jump into some questions. Uh, so these questions are being fielded initially from the Whova app as well as 
uh, this chat. So if you want to message the chat with any additional questions, we'll try to get to those as well. But the first question we have is, what is the best way to keep participants engaged during virtual events? Uh, I feel like I've already addressed this in, in my video, so I'm not going to belabor too much time because I'm confident everyone's going to rush out of this uh, panel discussion and pull up my video and watch it and be totally enthralled. So I'm not going to waste time addressing that, but I would love to hear the rest of our panel's response to that. So um, what are some of the best engagement things you all have used? Uh, looking at Brother DeBrock, go ahead. Yeah, uh, one of the things that's really worked well for us once you get everyone into whatever platform you're using, whether it's a, you know, a brief Facebook call, a large Zoom call, um, or something completely different, uh, sometimes we just use conference lines. Um, one of the ways to really make sure people stay engaged um, is to, to ask for their participation or even, um, you know, rather than having one person speaking, call people out to, you know, who either have been pre-prepared or who you know have the information and will be willing to, to discuss. Um, that, that helps in two ways because the person who's asked to discuss or um, given the opportunity to, to give their perspective is instantly engaged. But it also, it changes the vocal timbre and you don't fall asleep listening to someone droning on forever and ever and ever about something that you don't necessarily have any interest in. Um, and so that, that's been a really useful tool for us, just kind of passing the ball around so that everyone gets to participate as much as possible, and then also making sure people have stuff to say. Excellent. Very good. I just committed one of the cardinal sins and talked while I was muted. Um, yeah, so, and I appreciate... Uh, Sister Winget demonstrating that in the chat by asking a question that asked people to respond and react. So that's a great example of that. What are other thoughts on how to keep people engaged through presentations? I'm a big fan of breakout rooms. Um, I think those are very, very helpful. And I think convention this year is a perfect example of this because you, got, you can at night go to three to four different events in a row and breakout rooms are very similar to that. You can pop in and out and talk to different people. And it's hard when you've got 40 people on the screen, it's hard to have a good conversation. But when you cut that down to four, it can be a lot easier to have that conversation. And then you talk to, you have one of your people in your breakout room speak for you when you go to the, the larger group. So it's a way to capture everybody's um, information without having to, unmute yourself and, you know, hope that you're heard and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And breakout rooms is something I really push in the video. In fact, we did an exercise in the video presentation um, where we made everyone go into a breakout room. They all had to tell each other a joke and then they had to vote on who had the best joke. And we brought everybody back to the general and we called on each group representative to tell a joke. That's a great way to add some levity, but also to kind of change things up so that you're in a smaller setting, more comfortable sharing. Um, because when it's a group of 250 attorneys, uh, it's kind of intimidating to speak up and talk. But when it's only about 10, 15 people, that's a great resource. So thank you for speaking to that. Brett, I think I saw that you had your hand up as well. What do you got for us? So I liked actually, uh, Nicole covered a lot of it, but I'd like to add uh, one thing with the breakout rooms that helped was beneficial for our event. So we had one segment for networking purposes. We uh, posed a question that was related to an ethical dilemma. And we had, we had these breakout rooms where students and alumni and law school students talked about the, uh, talked through the question and uh, it was a great opportunity just to get to know some people. They began introducing themselves, kind of leading into something interesting about themselves. And uh, again, it's just, it was informal. It was uh, nice to talk to people and get to know one another. And that was a nice way to engage the audience and the students. Absolutely. I see we have a hand here from Adam Dotzler, Dotzler probably mispronounced that, I apologize, of the Buffalo Alumni Chapter, District 19. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Oh, I guess you can unmute yourself. So go ahead. 
Uh, good, good afternoon or good morning, brothers and sisters. Adam Dotzler, Buffalo Alumni Chapter, Alden Chapter, District 19. My question stems, I have a question stemming from like a technolo technology, obviously as being, the, being like on the, being on the board of a, uh, of an alumni chapter, we have a diverse array of members, some of whom are not, ex some of whom are older and are not exactly technologically savvy. So how do we find a way to keep them engaged in, if we want to hold a, virtual if we want to hold a virtual event and like does it mean like uh does it mean like uh walking them through some things uh engaging them in different ways or different platforms it's just that some some people can easily adapt to technology well i know as others it's rather for others it's rather difficult thank you yeah great question brett looked like and aaron you both have answers to this we'll go to uh brett first and then we'll go to aaron Brother Adam, great question. Uh, so we actually encountered this with our event. We had a couple older participants that uh, struggled through using the Zoom technology. And what was cool about Zoom that we, uh, why we used it is because you can also call in and you can, it's another way to still participate, but you just don't have the video visual and you can't see the person's face but they still can participate and so with one of our older members uh he was unable we uh thought just by creating the link and making it as easy as possible for our uh speakers that it would just go out fine but he had issues so then we found out we could have him call in and he, it still worked out great he was able to participate and um there's other ways. I know Chicago alumni uses this um, go to meeting, I think it is, where they have a lot of their lunch virtual meetings that they just have a discussion. They'll, um, they can call in uh, and it just announces like who's participating. It's a really cool platform for that. So that's a way to uh, engage the older members. With that being said, I'm out. Very good. Thank you. And Brother DeBrock? I'd love to tweak the question just ever so slightly so that it's not just about older members because sometimes I have just as many technological problems and uh, sometimes um, our oldest members are the ones that help me fix it. Um, but um, uh, there's three things you need. Deference, patience, and adequate staffing. You need to listen to what what the person thinks is the problem and then figure out what that actually translates to as in, you know, I can't pick up the phone while you're sitting at zoom. There's, you know, you need to click a button, you know, and, and then patience, you need to be able to spend the time with the person perhaps in a dry run before the meeting, perhaps not. Um, and then uh, staffing, you know, if you're, if you're having a large group of people come in, whether that's, you know, a group of 12 or a group of 200, you need to have enough people on point to, to be able to assist, to, to get everyone up to speed. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's really what I would say. You, you just, you want to make sure you have the resource available to walk people through. One of the things that's happened, uh, you, uh, many of you are aware that we're, um, Alaska with Knoxville has been hosting out in the hall, a continuous kind of uh, video chat room that's available for you to just kind of pop into and pop out of. One of the cool things that happened with that was we accidentally became tech support for the, the day before convention. <laughs> and there were a, a few of us who thought that might happen. And there were a number of other members who, who just happened to be hanging out, out, out in the, we were calling it the lobby at the time. And they, kind of came up with really um, useful ways to talk people through, okay, this seems to be the problem you're having. Is your camera broken? Or do you, know, do you have another way to, to go about this to make sure that we can get you as included as possible? And then once we got everyone up to speed, you also have to defer to the fact that they may not want their camera on even though it works. You know, and, and things like that are very, very important. And so you know that have the staff be deferential to to people's personal preferences and have a heck of a lot of patience build some some flex time into things sometimes that's my thoughts we have a perfect case study on that um coming up at 
2 p.m. today with uh, Fred Gray, our keynote speaker. Um, he had no interest in Zoom whatsoever, but he was very gracious, like you said, working with us. And it took a lot of man hours. Sister Greta and the executive office have been working with him and his staff. And, and, and you've got to find that, particularly for keynote speakers, you've got to find that good point of contact that will mediate for you almost. And I don't mean that in a negative way. But you'll, I think you'll see how it plays out because it's going to have a little bit of a different feel because, as Brother Doberg said, we have to show deference to their preferences as our guests and our speakers. So it's kind of cool to see some of this playing out in uh, real life. Absolutely. Thank you both for weighing in, or all three of you, I guess, for weighing in on that. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do on a practical note, too, is, um, you know, whatever platform you're using, a lot of them do a good job of having a step-by-step -step guide of how to download the software, how to make sure your webcam and your audio is working, and then you can get that information to that participant um, in a way that they're comfortable with, whether it's email, carrier pigeon, smoke signals. Um, and I have found that a lot of people, Zoom in particular, that's what I've worked with the most, is very intuitive. My boss, uh, who still dictates everything into a dictaphone uh, and thinks that the CD disk drive on his computer is a cup holder, um, he has learned how to use Zoom in this pandemic. And so I think that it is something... Um, it's helping them kind of get over this preconceived notion that they can't do it because it really isn't that tricky. Um, but as, as Brother DeBrock pointed out, I mean, patience goes a long way. Uh, Aubrey, did you have something to add? Aubrey Maples, Justice Watson Jr. Chapter. Yes, briefly, Brother. The other thing that we have found to be useful, especially when we're working with people outside of our university who may not be as familiar with Zoom, is we will have a practice session before an event. And this gives us a chance to work on any technology bugs that they may be experiencing or that we may be experiencing as hosts, and it gives them an opportunity to get familiar with the environment. Thank you. All right, very good. Well, we'll go ahead and move to our next question. Uh, and I, I actually really appreciate this question. It is, what is the optimal duration for a virtual meeting? Uh, and so I'm just curious, I want to hear everybody else weigh in before I prove myself to be wrong. So, um, Aubrey, since we just got to hear from you, let's go back to you again. Would you be willing to repeat the call of the question? Yes, sorry. So how long should these types of meetings last, ideally? It depends. Um, <laughs> we're all law students or lawyers here. It's always, it depends. Um, for our chapter meetings, we try to stay within 45 minutes. That seems to be about the amount of attention span that people have. For our lunch and learn events, while we do have some variation in the length of time that we have them, the longest we've had was one hour, 15 minutes, and the shortest we had was 45 minutes. So again, we're going to try to stay within that 45 minute time frame because again, that seems to be about the attention span that most people have. Uh, yeah, let's go to uh, Brother Hyink. This is actually a great question, too, because uh, when we were going through our event, we had various durations of time with each one. We originally planned for each one to be only an hour, but uh, one of our speakers, he started off talking about his topic of being a general practitioner and ended up kind of going off on a tangent with uh, – life advice for another hour. So it went for about two hours, which totally, and it, there's uh when, when you have speeches like that and you know, it's only supposed to be an hour, you don't want to be rude. And some, that's how some of the participants felt, but then it lacked participation for other events. So that's another thing to keep in mind, especially with these kind of events is um, especially for uh, meetings. I know we've been having 30 minutes, just structured around business and then maybe 30 minutes to follow up with people, see how they're doing. And then that probably will consist of most of the time. With that, I'm out. All right, very good. Um, I'm curious to hear the online educator and uh, your professional advice on this, uh, Sister. Nerding out here a little bit for a moment, but the research shows that for adult education, and I consider all of our fraternity members are at the adult education stage, your attention span for straight at being talked at is somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. There's a million factors that can go in that. 
But for every time you break out with an interactive exercise where people engage, you ex extend that time each time. So no matter what you're doing, 10 to 15 minutes of talking, exercise. 10 to 15 minutes of talking, exercise. That is going to stretch out people's ability to pay attention a heck of a lot longer. Um, it's um, uh, just being lectured at is, is never the most fun thing. But as um, Sister Justice said, um, uh, Sister Maple, sorry, I was reading the wrong part of the screen. Uh, <laughs> it really does depend. But academic research between 10 to 20 minutes, um, but extended each time you take some form of interactive exercise. Very good. All right. And then, uh, Brother DeBrock, do you want to weigh on, in on this as well? Yeah, we've we've had all sorts of range on this. Um, we've found that our if we're doing an executive meeting or something like that, 30 minutes is probably too long. Um, it's, you know, the, those things are often at the end of the workday or in the middle of the workday, and it just needs to get done. We need our information in and out, and then we know what to do. But that's that's because that's a board, and we'll, we'll seek information later. For our actual member meetings, we've done a couple of member meetings that have been really kind of neat. Um, and those... Those, it seems like intending to take about 45 minutes is really the sweet spot. But we always try to budget an hour because what ends up happening is we, we want that fluff space in, in case some discussion goes long. Um, but we also want um, some social time. And so the member meetings, we, we will set a start time and sit, tell people to come five minutes early. And then we'll start five minutes late because, you know, we're all over a relatively vast map and people want to be able to chit chat sometimes. And so we allow for kind of an open room beforehand. And then at the end of that, um, either people will have things to do, they'll need to make dinner or whatever. Or the last one, we had a pre-convention um, board meeting or pre-convention chapter meeting. Um, everyone was going to you know, hang up and, and go their separate ways. And then it ended up being um, more than half the chapter wanted to continue talking about things completely unrelated to the meeting. And so we just left it open. Um, and that went for another 15 minutes and people got to really catch up and feel connected and feel engaged in a way um, you normally would be able to, you know, go out and, and chit chat with people after a meeting or after a service or something like that. And so that was, that was really neat, but it totally depends. You know, our chapter meetings are about 12 to 15 people. Our district has been doing um, virtual meetings for some time now. I think we've had four of them and uh, those have to be a little bit more regimented. You spend a little bit more time letting people get into the room. Um, but then once the meeting is done, you don't want to leave that open-ended. And so that, that ends up taking about an hour 15 because there's a lot of people and there's a lot of stuff to get through. But the person who's running it, uh, Melody Peters, marshals herself incredibly well and just stays on topic. So it, it really, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, with some, some social events, sometimes you want to budget three hours. It just, it really depends. And you, it's important to read the room as well. Yeah, some great points there. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to mention based off that, the social aspect, um, if you are doing like the Zoom platform, it's a good idea when you're setting up your meeting to send out that invitation. One of the options is whether when you leave the room, it ends it for everybody. Um, and I would encourage you not to do that if you want to encourage that conversation and flow. Now, um, if it's like a court proceeding, which I'm doing at work all the time, uh, you obviously don't want a record of stuff that attorneys are saying to their clients and things like that, uh, which sometimes they do, even though there's a blinking red dot in the corner. But yeah, be aware that that is an option to keep the conversation going, even if you personally have to duck out for one reason or another. So great, great points there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and transition now to another question that we have. Um, what virtual pl platforms are most accessible for our members? Um, do we have thoughts on that, panelists? Yeah, we'll go to you, Brother Hyink. 
Well, it just depends on what type of event you're hosting. I mean, or meeting or anything, because what I found is that, um, especially for formal business related situations, especially um, for meetings, uh, board meetings, we use Teams, we use Microsoft Teams and it works out well, it's free. Um, and you're able to still like text and communicate afterwards. It's all in one uh, mobile like phone app and also on it can go on your computer. So it's really nice um, to have that. And then for Zoom, uh, pretty much that would be for large size group meetings, uh, events, things like that. That's at least what we've been doing at UIS. That I'm out. Very good. And I appreciate Brother Hyde. You're the only one who's being disciplined about saying out. So I'm I'm terrible at that. Um, I guess because I'm never really committed to stop talking. That's probably why. So um, any other thoughts on that? I think that was a, a great answer to that question. It really depends on what you're looking for. Um, but a lot of people have done a great job of making these platforms free and accessible to everyone, both on a mobile platform as well as a desktop or laptop computer. Um, next question, what types of events will get the most participation? Uh, and the answer, the, the glib answer to that question is the engaging and interesting ones. Um, but panelists, I guess I'll, I'll defer to you. How do you make events engaging and interesting? Uh, I know that we've talked about some of the content, subject matter. Uh, we've talked about some ways to keep people engaged once they're in. Uh, any follow-up discussion on how to make events worth participating in? Yeah, we'll go to Justice Aubrey Maples. Thank you, brother. Aubrey Maples, Justice Watson Jr. Chapter. The things that we have found to be most useful is asking our members what it is they want to hear, um, especially for our Lunch and Learn series. We just went to our, our members and said, okay, this is what we're doing. What is it that you want to know more about? And that's how we cultivated essentially our playlist, the things that we're asking about, the types of events that we're hosting. During our regular chapter meetings, those are just chapter meetings and we can't make those interesting. But we did have an event where we dressed up in Disney characters. So that was kind of fun. So that's kind of what we do is we just ask, you know, what is it that you want and then meet folks where they're at. Thank you. It's great advice. In uh, the Zoom pr presentation I previously gave, one of the things I address is anytime you're having a meeting, uh, you need to answer obviously all questions, who, what, when, where, why, how, uh, but really drill down on what are you meeting about and why should we care? And so that's, that's great advice. We want to make sure that the listeners actually care about what we're doing. Otherwise, they don't have much incentive to participate. Uh, Sister Winget, did you have something to add? Um, I think it ties into this, but I wanted to dis discuss the concept of making sure you're managing your documents in a manner that in the virtual environment, your members can see it. And it, it ties into engagement for me because um, who's been at a meeting when the agenda hasn't been shared in advance and then you're trying to share links to where it's stored and all that kind of stuff. Um, so while we're talking about engaging members in our meetings, make sure that includes proper document, document management and accessibility. Um, preferably before the meeting, but also, um, you know, how you screen share it, all that kind of stuff. And then on top of that, just one trick that I use, and I know this is in my classroom environment, but people love gamification. So anytime you can throw a Kahoot in a, in a meeting or have a poll pop up on the screen, it engages people and resets that attention clock. To, to piggyback on that, if I may, um, one of the things with sending out the agenda in advance or the documents you'll need for whatever you're doing um, is a really great way to, without being annoying and without looking like you're just adding clutter to someone's inbox, send that reminder that you need to send um, either two days out or, you know, the morning before or whatever. Um, I, I know for our members, that's one of the big things because we're just a bunch of busy people spread all over the map. Um, People don't want to be overloaded, but you absolutely have to send them those reminders or they will forget. Um, and, you know, having the information you need is crucial. And um, sometimes there's things that you can't send out in advance. And so if, if it's one of those things, something that'll be announced that's a surprise or something like that, it's super helpful to have 
you know, if, if I were announcing something, it would be super helpful to have my justice, my vice justice be the person on the button to send an email as it's announced. So having that extra, that extra step of planning is really, really useful. Um, and it makes it look effortless, um, even though it takes a little bit of effort to get you prepped. Excellent. Yes. All great advice. Definitely ways to uh, make sure your audience can stay engaged. And then also um, very good point about subtly reminding them by giving that, that information. I love that. And I know I've personally done that and I've also delegated to other people to do it. So it doesn't just look like me blowing up their inbox all the time too. So uh, next question we have here is what are some tips for hosting and moderating a virtual event? I promise I didn't submit this question, uh, but I wish I had the answer to it before today. So uh, panelists, what are your thoughts? What are some good tips for hosting and moderating virtual events? Yeah, we'll go to uh, Brother Hayink. So when we were introducing each of our speakers, uh, we basically had a formal introduction. We gave a brief bio of, kind of each speaker, what they're going to talk about. And then um, we, entered, we had them then go into their speech. And then once we got into questions, we made sure to address that anybody can put their questions in the chat box. This was on the Zoom platform, by the way. Um, they can put it in the chat box or they could do the raise hand feature. It's um, just, you kind of have to create like a certain list of different things you want to make sure you hit, like um, just uh, to keep it all formal and organized. Put that I'm out. So on that very strident reminder, I know you're not trying to shame me by doing it, but you make me feel bad every time you say I'm out. But that actually is a great way to moderate a panel discussion. As one thing I've been incredibly impressed with uh, the different members in the general sessions is signaling that they're done talking. That way they know they're not going to get stepped on by somebody else. So that's another great tip for moderating a panel discussion because there's nothing more frustrating than playing the game where you talk over each other. That happens in real life, and, and it's easier to read some of those nonverbals to know, okay, I need to be quiet and let them talk, uh, but it's especially difficult when there's lag. So signaling that you're done talking is very important, uh, and with that, I'm out, and we'll invite anyone else that wants to weigh in to do so. Uh, yes, uh, Justice Maples, go ahead. Aubrey Maples, Justice Watson, Junior Chapter. One of the things that we do, I'm trying to figure out how to share it, is we use a splash slide for when people are joining our events. There we go. And I just included a screenshot. And basically what that does is it communicates our expectations for behavior and it communicates in this case, our agenda for a meeting. So that as everybody is entering the room, before everybody gets started, there is a clarification of basically the rules that we're going to abide by. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yes, that, that is great information as well. Um, it, you know, having that kind of intro thing to make people feel welcome is a, is a great hosting tip too. Brother DeBrock, do you have something for us? Yeah, just an additional one. Um, if you have a big meeting, it would be helpful to have someone dedicated to do this that's not the speaker. But a, a very important tool we've learned, particularly with the Out in the Hall experiment um, and with some of our Zoom parties previously, don't lose your moderator tools. And, and if Zoom refreshes or if whatever platform you're using has a hiccup and refreshes and then suddenly no one's a moderator, know how to get those back. Um, with Zoom, it's whoever created the meeting. If they log back in, they'll automatically be able to take moderator control and can designate it out. But um, having those tools sometimes are your best way to be able to um, stop a heated debate for two seconds and say, hold on, you're saying this, you're saying this, let's take a minute. And sometimes when you're having a business meeting or you're just having an open discussion, that gets really important. In other, other situations where you have a, a speaker or something like that, it won't be as important. Um, but when you have a speaker, you also want to be able to mute everyone else so that you don't hear what's going on in their background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great advice there. Um, you know, I actually started cutting my tooth on the 
cutting my tooth, cutting my teeth on the Zoom platform, helping with uh, the middle school Sunday school that I assist here. And uh, that taught me the almighty value of the mute all button. And that is something that you want to familiarize yourself with almost immediately. Uh, occasionally, the like turn off other people's video one becomes helpful on occasion too, because middle schoolers are weird. Um, so anyway, definitely be familiar with your moderator capabilities and use those. And then, uh, as you said, Brother DeBrock, it's important to kind of have a contingency plan if there's a hiccup. Uh, as I said at the beginning, usually I actually have a safety um, that's uh, like an iPad set up right next to me in case my computer should go down for some reason. I can switch all my authority and sign in onto the iPad and run it from there until I can get the computer back up. So that's something I would also advise um, just to prevent that. So other thoughts on, um, on, on this topic? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, what is the recommended frequency of having virtual events in a given week, month, et cetera? Uh, Justice Maples, go ahead. I'm sorry, Brother Cunningham. I saw a hand from Sister Coy. Yes, go ahead, Sister Coy. Hi, everyone. I'm a Coy Rasco chapter. I had an unrelated question, so we can go ahead and answer, have the panelists answer this one first, and then I can ask mine if that's okay. It's up to you. I mean, go ahead. You've got the floor already. Might as well okay. take it up. So this year, as we know, things are different. And so one of the things that our school is asked to do is the student organization fair. And um, so including breakout rooms is something I'm thinking about. But I was just wondering if there was any ideas that the panelists could share about how to make that um, an inviting event where people want to join our chapter and Phi Alpha Delta. Thank you. Yeah, Brother DeBrock, go ahead. I would make sure you have a reason for them to come. I mean, that's that sounds very glib the way I just phrased it. But, um, and if you're doing multiples, you could come up with different reasons for people to show up. One of the things that's been really successful in um, one of the groups I'm part of, the Long Ash chapter, um, has been they have this organizing principle. They get together and BS like you're smoking cigars. And half the people who come don't smoke at all. Um, but that's been really useful for, as a guiding principle to like, oh, I know exactly what that sort of conversation is going to be like. And so for a chapter doing recruitment, uh, you could do a virtual happy hour. You could do a virtual soda fountain. You could do a virtual ice cream social. And those are things that are familiar enough that it'll give a, a person kind of a half concept of what to expect. If you wanted to, you could do a virtual round table with, you know, employers too. That would be a completely different type of event, but it would show, it would show like the value of PAD to a potential member. Um, but yeah, that, those are my thoughts. Other, Corey, if I may ask, is this a like a student fair like you would normally have on the quad, but now we're putting it into a virtual environment? Yes, it's, okay. it's the same thing, just in Zoom rooms instead of cables. So you're competing with other people at the same time right? To get their attention. Um, I love the idea of a theme that uh, Brother Dobrak was just talking about. I think that's brilliant. Um, also have a token for coming and it can be a virtual token. Look at the flair we're doing for the virtual convention. So you attended our meeting. Here's, you know, your virtual flair. The next time we're able to meet and who knows when that would be, you can trade this in for a cookie or something like, you know, I, I'm using some cheesy examples, but to, to Brother Dobrik's point of give them a point for being there. Um, that's a great way. Um, and then uh, make sure you collect their information, their name and email, however you do that, whether that's through a quick quiz or some electronic sign-up form, because as you know, they're going to whip through those student fairs real, real quick, and you want to, you know, get their data as quickly as possible. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. Uh, and, and that's exactly what I was going to say is have some sort of incentive for them to log into the call in the first place um, so that they have an opportunity to be engaged and interested in what's going on. And then, yeah, so you write down their name, their email, that way you can find ways to follow up with them. 
The other thing I would add to this, and this isn't exclusive to a Zoom platform, uh, but the personal touch always goes a long way when inviting people to attend things like this. Um, not just a, a giant email to every one of the new 1Ls coming in, uh, but find a way break it up amongst your officers to send a semi-personalized email to everyone, even if it's just as little effort as, you know, putting in a template form where it'll substitute in everybody's name. At least it shows that they're more than, you know, dear student or dear 1L. So um, anything you can do to, to make it feel like they've got a connection there already, um, you know, invite them to, to reach out to you in the chat as soon as they sign in. That way they feel like they've kind of got a friendly, a friendly face that they can, they can be associated with. Um, so yeah, great, great question. Uh, and, and good luck to you. Um, I'm sure we will continue to brainstorm ways. The virtual flare I think is a neat idea as well. So we will go ahead and take up the question that I started. Um, what do we think in terms of um, how frequently we should be doing these types of meetings? Are we going to burn people out on Zoom? If we're doing them weekly, do we recommend monthly? What are our panelists' thoughts on that beyond the stock answer of it depends? Yeah, Brother Hyink. Well, so with the ideas about like what type of events, I mean, meetings in general, we all have structures with our uh, bylaws. We have maybe once a month, twice a month, things like that. That's uh, aside from actual events. Now with events themselves, I know we have planned already with the UIS pre-law chapter to have a couple virtual events that are related to various um something similar to what we just had where we have other different attorneys come in and talk about their practice of law, but in a day, and it's just a one hour, each day is a different topic related to criminal law, intellectual property, corporate law, things like that. And we also have thought up another week, but that will get us the most involvement, but then it also gives us time to make sure that event goes smoothly and we can plan it. And we were thinking about having that once, like one week um, of events per month. And that's at least what we're doing with our chapter during this COVID pandemic. With that being said, I'm out. Go ahead, Sister Winget. Uh, thank you. So Zoom burnout is a real thing. It's unquestionably a real thing. And don't forget that every, every version of people's lives are doing the same exact thing that Phi Alpha Delta is doing. So I don't know about any of you, but I've attended more meetings in the last three months than I have probably the last... 10 years combined because there's this mentality that we have a ton more free time because we're not commuting or we're not going to sit in class, but you have to be aware that it burnout really is a thing. Um, I know it's a, kind of a joke, but I describe myself as an extroverted introvert. Love talking with people. Uh, my boyfriend sees, says he can see me flip the light switch when I need to get up and talk, but this is exhausting for me. I went to bed at 8 p.m. last night, you guys, because <laughs> this drains people. So just keep that in mind and um, not to give the stock answer, but you have to, it does depend. It depends on your demographic, your audience. You know, law school students' schedules are way different than a judge's schedules or a professor's schedule. Um, so keep that in mind and don't forget everybody has a million other uh, situations where they're sitting on a Zoom call. So respect that. Very good. Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, Justice Maples, did you have stuff to add? Thank you. Aubrey Maples, Justice Watson Jr. Chapter. One of the things that we struggled with when we initially made this transition to virtual meetings was whether or not we really actually needed to have a meeting about something. So that was one of the first things that we as a chapter put a stop to right real quick. We instead, we have a group chat that we'll use through Facebook Messenger for our executive board. We've been making use of this technology available to us through the school in order to send out messages to our student organizations. And we've been using Zoom as well, but we meet once a month for a chapter meeting and then we have one other extra event during the month. And that's to help keep people from being overwhelmed. The other thing that we do is we utilize technology to make our 
access to our events more accessible. So all of our Lunch and Learns events are also recorded and hosted on YouTube so people can view them at a time that's more convenient to them. Thank you. And yeah. Oh, go ahead, Brother DeBrock. Sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, and for us, we're in a little bit of a different situation in Alaska. Just getting started, um, our aspiration at this point would be to be able to do quarterly chapter meetings and then from quarterly meetings to jump toward having monthly events as well. Um, before the pandemic really got started, we, we had been just barely successful at doing monthly events. We had our initiation and then the very following next following month, we did a something to do with the Iditarod. And then um, long before the snow melted off, we, we couldn't do in-person things anymore. Um, and so since we're ramping up and since all but one of our officers who is in currently in two co covering two positions um, have taken the bar during this period, um, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get people, keep people mean, uh, engaged, but then also build out our calendar. And once, once that calendar is there, if you already have a chapter that has a really well-developed calendar, keep it. Figure out how to make those events virtual because people will already expect to be doing something at those times. Uh, for us, because we're, we're mostly targeting um, mid-career prof professionals, um, we're, we're being very careful to ramp into it because we don't want to overwhelm anybody until they've experienced the value of our chapter. Very good. Yeah. Um, all good, good information. Uh, definitely appreciate the concept of make sure that it's really worth having the Zoom meeting uh, to avoid that burnout. Uh, there are a lot of Zoom meetings that I've attended that an email could have easily sufficed. And so, um, that is that is good advice something to keep in mind um i know that we're running close on our original time cut off um and i see miss baranowski has re-emerged um are we doing okay on time or yeah don't worry i've been here the whole time i just you know cut my, my video off um <laughs> you guys are good on time um as a reminder fred gray starts promptly at 2 p.m so um, if you guys would like to go a few extra minutes, you can, but I really wouldn't suggest going more than until like 140 or so, so that everyone has a little bit of a break. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and that actually brings up a, a good point that I wanted to touch on earlier in terms of engagement. One way to make sure that you can keep your audience engaged is by encouraging as many people as possible to have their video turned on. Um, if for no other reason, uh, being morbidly curious at what other people are doing when other people are talking. I personally always keep my view uh, in the grid form so I can watch as many people's faces as possible. Uh, it's a good way for me to read nonverbals and then also to silently judge people for the things that they're doing when I'm talking. So I'd encourage you to capitalize on that as well. Um, Next question that we have, and uh, if the individual who asked it is present, feel free to clarify. Uh, it's how do you make an interactive event for more than 10 people? Um, in terms of mechanics, I mean, you set up a, a Zoom meeting or, or set up a Teams meeting or whatever, um, and more than 10 people can attend. Um, if it's an engagement question, I'd be curious for uh, the panel's thoughts on that. How do you keep 10 people engaged? Um, do we have any, any thoughts amongst the panel on that? I'm looking to see if I have a hand raised and I don't see one. Uh, go ahead, Brother Dobrik. I can offer some thoughts on that. A lot of the, the times, um, I mean, it depends on your platform. If you're using Citrix, it's going to be a little bit clunkier than if you're using Zoom. But uh, it's it's the same tools. Um, you just kind of have to scale them a little bit. If you've got a room full of 100 people, you don't want to do a lot of individual call-outs um, because at, you might end up with a ton of chaos. <laughs> but um, passing, passing the speakership on to different people and having different people present allows for engagement. And at the same time, you really want to set those expectations, even if you've sent them out 
on paper before or in an email. You really want to set those expectations of how people can participate. And so if you're having, you know, a Q&A, tell people how to raise their hand, whether or not it's, you know, doing this or it's typing something in the chat. Um, that'll allow people to, to actually engage. And um, there's a, a number of other ways people can, can engage. Uh, like Nicole Winget said, quizzes are great. Um, one of the, the parties last night um, was oriented around watching something. Um, and and it, was, it was great because they took input beforehand and then what was presented later uh, was based off of that input. And so there may have been 15 minutes, 10 minutes of people actually getting to talk and getting to say what, you know, say their piece and throwing out their input. But, you know, for the whole two and a half hours, it felt like everyone kind of felt like they'd gotten to say their piece and be engaged. And so that's, those are some, some options, some tools. And that's it for me. Very good. All right. Seeing no other thoughts on this from the panel, we'll actually segue off of that very nicely, Brother Dobrik. Um, one of the questions we had, and I'm going to defer to someone with more legal experience than me, possibly someone who teaches in this area. How do we use online activities that are not simple group calls, but more interactive like movie nights and karaoke, dance parties, without getting into any kind of copyright issues? I'm really curious to see if the panel has any thoughts on this because I know we've been doing some watch parties. Uh, are we monitoring that and what do we need to know? Sister Winget? So as far as like the dance parties go, if you're not using it, and I am not a copyright attorney by any means, I was a criminal defense attorney before I got into education. Um, if you're not using it to then share, like save and then share to raise funds or anything, um, you're usually okay. Don't put anything with copyrighted music on YouTube. They'll pull it down faster than you can click save. It's amazing how fast they are on it. Um, one thing I always preach as an academic is not a single thing you are doing on the internet is private ever, period. I don't care how many passwords and firewalls and happy dances you do to keep people from seeing this stuff. If it is on the web, it is potentially discoverable, uh, not from a legal standpoint, but from um, a, a search standpoint. Uh, one of my other careers is in the Navy, and I've had my data stolen from the U.S. government, the Office of Personal Management, twice in my career. China, I'm pretty sure, has my social security number saved somewhere. Um, so when you're looking at privacy, copyright, all that kind of stuff, just keep that in mind that, that um, you know, put protections in place, um, but don't do anything you wouldn't want recorded for uh, posterity. And then it's my understanding um, from an academic standpoint that as long as you are using it for um, um, learning experiences, not to make money necessarily, most documents, photos, images are fine as long as you are careful about where you share them. Um, I see someone, um, uh, Sister Maples, you were commenting on the 15 seconds. Has that worked for you? Because I've gotten I've gotten snagged a few times with with clips I thought were less than 15 seconds. We just didn't post it on YouTube. There um, you go. Yeah, we, that's the way to do it. We sh I my background is in education. I taught online through um, Sinclair Community College okay. and Rock State University, and so. I'm very cognizant of the limitations that are being used for digital copyright infringement. So we kept our music that we used for this event for less than 15 seconds for each one. And we also didn't post it on YouTube. It's not available on Facebook. It was shared directly with our graduating class through a Dropbox link. That's very smart. And there are, I was actually editing a video this morning for another organization. There's surprisingly large amount of free stock music that you can get. It's not outstanding. I was literally looking for cheesy 80s music and I was able to find, find what I needed. So leverage those free resources as well to avoid copyright. Because from experience, there's nothing that stinks more than putting time and effort into making a beautiful video and then you log in and YouTube's like, just kidding. <laughs> They're vicious about it. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I know I just got done uh, losing a campaign for a county attorney out here, and I shamelessly stole everything from the free copyright uh, media 
uh, from images to copyright free music to copyright free video stock. Uh, so yeah, you can find a, a very mediocre version of pretty much anything that you would actually want to pay for and own. Um, it's not yeah, so stealing, Brother Cunningham. It's acquisitioning. You are not stealing. You are acquisitioning. <laughs> right. I'm leveraging the resources at my disposal. Um, Brother Dobrik, did you want to weigh in on this as well? Um, I I just said fair use. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add. All right. Excellent. Well, we will transition to an, another question. Uh, looks like we've got a couple left and we're doing okay on time. Um, what is the best strategy for communicating information pre and post event? Uh, we kind of talked about that earlier. It's going to depend on your audience. Uh, if they're comfortable with email, if they're comfortable in a group chat, um, you know, Facebook Messenger, uh, if you guys do um, group me, things like that. Whatever they're most comfortable with is probably the best strategy for communicating that information. Uh, but, and if that means personally tailoring it to each individual within reason, if it's amongst your officers of, you know, five to 10 people, that's pretty doable. If it's a hundred members in your chapter or more, uh, then maybe you got to pick one or the other, but uh, it's going to depend on your audience. Uh, another question we have, and then I'll be happy to consult the chat. If you have questions right now, um, and you maybe asked them way earlier in the chat when I was distracted scrambling, um, go ahead and resubmit those questions at this time. Uh, this is the last pre-prepared question we have. It is, should we continue using virtual platforms even after the pandemic is over? And how can virtual events be beneficial for both the promotion of the organization and the active engagement of PAD members? So let's take up the first portion of that question first. Should we keep using virtual platforms after the pandemic? Uh, we'll do uh, Justice Maples first, and then we'll come to you, Brother High Inc. Um, Aubrey Maples, Justice Watson Jr. Chapter. Yes, absolutely. What we have found throughout the course of this wonderful social experience that we're calling COVID pandemic is that by having virtual events, it actually allows more people to participate who would not otherwise be able to participate. Um, at our school, like I mentioned before, a lot of our students are non-traditional. That means that we have a lot of people who work and who are not at the school on a regular sort of schedule. By having our meetings virtual, we're opening up access to Phi Alpha Delta to people who might otherwise not be able to participate as much as they would like. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and then Brother Hyink? I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Sister Aubrey. The participation scale we're seeing with this is tremendous. For one, um, I was looking at some uh, stats with uh, the amount of members per state, at least with Illinois for sure. And there's about 10,000 members, I think roughly around there that are in Illinois and looking to see the activity, who's active, who's not. Um, it was, there was a significant difference. Well, with virtual platforms is that a lot of, a lot of those people are unable to, some are, I know pre-law students and law school students who some can afford to go to big trips and do different things, go to conventions, and some can't. Well, with having Zoom in these virtual platforms, you can open up little events, small events, small networking events with 100, 200 people, and you can open that up for less than, I mean, like here it was 70, I think, 75 or something for students. You can even have some that are just free and it just still gets them active and involved and keeps promoting the ideals of this fraternity. And that's at least what I'm going to keep uh, continuously trying to emphasize is to keep having these events in order to gain membership from especially the pre-laws, because that's a big sector in the fraternity is the pre-laws. And we need to get them involved as well. With that, I'm out. Very good. Brother Dobrik? Yeah, I, I'm a huge advocate for hybrid meetings. Um, one of the things that you, we can continue to use virtual technology for in the future, it, in addition to the things that are just easier to do through a Zoom call or through a conference call, um, are pulling extra people in, just like Brett and, and Aubrey were saying. What we've done in Alaska, when we did our initiation and our chapter installation last January, um, 
we had a couple of difficulties. Our, uh, the dean of my law school, I went to Seattle University School of Law, uh, was qualified for membership by virtue of running a program based in Alaska. Um, and we wanted to initiate her. We also wanted someone from the International Executive Board um, to do the in installation for us. Well, those are really difficult to pull off on a Tuesday night when you're on the edge of the world. Um, and, and so we ended up having, it was a little bit clunky the way we did it. We had 15 people in a room, uh, in a conference room at a coffee shop. Uh, and we, we ended up having uh, our, my vice justice hold a laptop with Dean Clark from Seattle, linked in on video chat. And then we had um, uh, IJ elect brother uh, Mikkel um, sitting on someone else's lap and he conducted the installation for our chapter. And it was a great way to engage people and, and it allowed them to be like literally almost physically be in the room with us. Um, and so when, when brother Mikkel was going to speak, the person who was carrying him got up and put him on the podium, you know? Uh, and it was, it just, it made it a really, really fun, really memorable event. And then because there is always some benefit to that physical, you know, that, that token you take away, um, we had all of our members who were in person physically sign our membership book. But with Dean Clark not being in Alaska, um, we put it in the mail and had her sign it physically, take a picture signing it, and then send it back to us. And that'll forever be in our chapter archives. And, and so there's, there's ways to blend the physical and the traditional and, and the, the very brand new virtual um, that are just a lot of fun. Um, and, and sometimes to coordinate those things, you have to make a whole lot more phone calls, but half the time people are really excited about that because so often we no longer hear each other's voices and, and you can convey so much more um, in, a, in a 10 minute or a two minute phone call than you might in a 25 minute email. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I would encourage people to continue using and leveraging virtual uh, meeting technology once we no longer have to use it. Thank you, Brother Dobrock. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. From here forward, now that we've all kind of been acclimated and um, I guess uh, inoculated with Zoom and, and remote technology in this pandemic, whether we wanted to be or not, it's a helpful tool to keep in our back pocket at the very least, but certainly something we can continue to use. You know, I think it's important as we eventually come out of this pandemic to take the opportunity to enjoy physical interactions and, and, and actually be together when possible. But as you point out, Brother Dobruck, when that's not an option, this is a great thing that, that people know how to use use now and that we can use. Um, and it makes people like members of our International Executive Board much more available to be a part of things like that. Uh, and they carry some notoriety and people get excited about seeing them at events. And so uh, that's something great. We are just about out of time here. Um, and so I, I guess I want to go ahead and thank our panelists so much for everything you did today. Thank you for um, your insight, your wisdom, and for making making me ultimately look good. If you enjoyed this, um, either give a, a clap uh, reaction or if you learned something, give us a thumbs up so that we know that we didn't totally waste your time here today. But thank you all for joining us. Uh, be sure to get to the uh, session coming up here at two o'clock. You won't want to miss it. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful afternoon.